Hello, book friends, and thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with The Inhabited Island by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. This book was originally published back in 1969 in Russia, Soviet-era Russian science fiction. It had a bit of a tortuous process, process uh, making its way to being published as a, in book form. Um, it, uh, it got caught up in the censorship of the day, and it, but it did finally appear in 1971 in a censored form. Uh, this was published at the time in English, translated into and published under the title Prisoners of Power back then. This edition was published by Chicago Review Press in 2020 and translated by Andrew Bromfield, and it is the uncensored uh, version of The Inhabited Island by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. So yeah, I've been working my way through through, through the Strugatsky Brothers novels, especially as these new translations have, have been coming out into English over the last few years. This is the second in that book that I've read that's in the Noon Universe, it's called, which is a book, I think there are about 10 books in the Noon Universe. So this book is set in that, in that universe. It's also the same universe that uh, the Hard to Be a God was set in. So those are the two that I've read now, uh, books from the Noon Universe. I will, I've will. i actually chatted all the previous six of the novels that I've read, so I will link to those chats down in the details below. The Noon Universe is pretty cool. It's sort of like a... It's a it's a sort of utopian earth, or, and then there's a there's these different races, and there's a race of wanderers that go around. I think in the galaxy, you know, and they help other races, other sorts of uh, species uh, progress. So that's sort of the universe we find ourselves in here. This book, what this book is about, I'm going to be really careful not to give anything away that I think would detract from a first time reader's experience with this book, but. It is, our main character here is named Maxim Kammerer, and he is from Earth. This is a Earth of the future. It's sort of like a utopian Earth, I, I gathered, you know, where there's no war, there's plenty, people live in abundance and, and in health, and um, anyway, he decides to take this job as, as, a, as an explorer, you know, to go to these planets and really basically make first contact with the with the um, you know life that's that's on these planets well he winds up sort of crash landing on this planet that's called I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it Sarax Sarax and he is kind of wandering around there and then all of a sudden his spaceship gets destroyed he he realizes right away when he lands that something is amiss on this planet because there's radiation in the water so he can tell that this is not a planet he's going to want to he detects a lot of pollution and so he it's a it, he knows it's a planet he doesn't want to stick around too long on but as it turns out um the uh inhabitants the that are around there th mistake his his ship for a weapon and destroy it and so he's basically stranded there he sort of takes all this in stride at first and thinks of himself kind of as like a robinson crusoe on, a, on an island with you know friendly friendly natives and you know he quickly realizes that it's not quite what he expected um for one this this planet is in a sort of perpetual state of war and so there is destruction all around. I already mentioned kind of the pollution, the radiation. There's been an atomic war, and then it's it's he he also runs across these sort of mechanized autom automatic sort of weapons of war that are still at work, even though the area is basically deserted. Although he does finally get taken. Um, basically prisoner, but he doesn't really realize this because he's got this really positive outlook. Um, and, you know, he, he can't speak the language at first. Actually, the first word he learns is a curse word. It's like marak marakash or something like that is kind of like a, a curse word. Um, but anyway, he, he, he learns the language quickly, but originally, you know, they, they think he's peculiar. He's just wearing these shorts and some shoes, and that's it. And he doesn't speak their language, and so they think he must be from the highlands, you know, or something. But they take him in. He goes to a mental institution at first. Um, but, you know, it's, he, he begins to sort of realize that where he is, he's actually in a basically a totalitarian 
type state. It's run by this group of mysterious figures called the Unknown Fathers. And so he um, he makes some friends, but he discovers more, you know, so through him we, we discover kind of, you know, more about this world. One thing that's really interesting, though, he, he finds out sort of right away is that people a couple of times a day get sort of swept up in kind of a patriotic fervor, right? Just sort of like an adoration of their leaders and of the, of the, um, of the, of basically of the government. Most people do. And then there's this subset of people that are known as degenerates that during this time when everybody else is, um, so wrapped up in sort of this fervor, they have these migraines, you know, so they have these terrible headaches. And so these people that cannot feel this uh, patriotic fervor are known as degenerates. And so there's a quote here that I thought I would read about the degenerates because they're sort of outcasts. Most of them are political prisoners at this point. Now, Maxim, being from Earth and, and, and you know, sort of this utopian Earth, he doesn't, ha he doesn't react either way to this... Um, this force, you know, so not to give away the secret of what the force is, but there's a force at work, right, that's controlling most of the population, but not all of the population. And then the part of the population that this force is not controlling are basically, by default, kind of enemies of, of the state. You know, they're, they're the ones known as the degenerates, and they sort of have this terroristic side of underground that our main character winds up getting involved with eventually. Um, but there's this quote here that I thought was kind of cool about the degenerates. It says, Maxim sadly looked at them all sitting there in front of him, all very different from each other. In ordinary circumstances, the idea of gathering together would never even have occurred to them. A former farmer, a former criminal, a former teacher, they had only one thing in common. They had been declared enemies of society. For some idiotic reason, they were detested by everybody, and the entire immense state apparatus of oppression was directed against them. So, you know, he he gets in he gets sort of tangled up with this group. Um, some of uh, political prisoners are there. Some of them are in the un, in a sort of an underground resistance. Um, and uh, he he's sort of reflecting on that, you know, and I think that's true a lot of times of outcasts, right? They don't have a lot in common with each other other than the fact that they're outcasts. And so I thought that was that was kind of interesting. So, yeah, our main character here, you know, um, as he gets more involved and he learns the language and as he understands more of what's going on around him, there's the threats of war all the time. There is... Part of the, as I mentioned, have part of the land, uh, the main sort of country. There's several different sort of uh, political uh, bodies, you know, like countries. Um, and there's two that's on the border, the northern border. That's uh, they they consider them their enemies. And then on the southern border, there are mutants from where there used to be, you know, and there was an, an older um, sort of atomic war. And then even further south to that are, are what are known as the barbarians. People don't know much about them other than they're very fearsome. Um, but he, and then there's other parts of, there's parts of the country that are basically uninhabited, but they are inhabited basically by these automated machines that are just still going. So if you go in, if you stray into this area, there are these automated tanks and all these other sorts of weapons that will start trying to kill you. So he starts, uh, Maxim, you know, why basically starts getting his ideals up, right? And understanding that, okay, this society has some problems and, you know, it's, it's offensive to me and this is what we need to do to change it. I mentioned there's forces at work, right? There is a force at work that cons that's controlling people's minds. And so Maxim thinks he, the goal there is in this, some of the resistance fighters that are the underground are trying to destroy that, you know? Um, but I thought there's a there's a really clear the really cool sort of section on that sort of how to create systemic change and what the perils of that are. So I'll just read a quote from from that from this section. It says, um, "The impatience of an agitated conscience." The conscience, the sorcerer said. Your conscious conscience has been pampered by constant attention. It starts groaning at the slightest discomfort, and your reason respectfully bows down to it instead of shouting at it and putting it at it 
put it, putting it in its place. Your conscience is outraged by the existing order of things, and with obedient haste, your reason by the existing order of things, and with your reason seeks ways to change this order. Sorry. Um, but the order has its own laws. These laws derive from the aspirations of immense masses of people, and they can only change with a change in those aspirations. So I think what he's saying here is like, yes, they're, you know, to, to make change. So, you know, you get offended by some sort of aspect of society and you think that needs to change. And so you start working, your reason, you know, starts becoming subservient to your ideal. It's like, is that really, what's the best way to change that? What's going to happen when we destroy that? You know, this is all things that, that, that he's not thinking about. And this is actually a lot, happens to a lot of people, I think, when they want some big societal change, like we need to change this or that. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking here of what came to mind immediately to me was free college tuition. So free college tuition sounds like a great thing. And it, you know, I agree that we need to make some reforms in, in the cost of, of higher education. But just to give everybody free, carte blanche, free higher education, like what would that look like? Like what would what would that, the downstream effects of that be? And so that would be the kind of like big systemic change that would really require your reason to work through, right? And And that's not always how revolutionaries really want, really think, right? So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, this about the, 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 um, the forces at work, um, that's kind of the main, the main, uh, I guess, driver of the revolutionary change that is, is being sought here is that sort of change, like overthrowing the unknown fathers. Um, and so without giving anything away there, um, that's really, um, I, I think, you know, what, what most of the book is about. But before I run out of time, I just wanted to touch base on one more thing. This quote at the end uh, here, that's really kind of hopeful, I thought. Um, so this world, they their cosmology, I think, it, their cos they think, they understand the universe to be that they're living inside of a sphere. You know, we know we live on the outside of a sphere. So we know there's a universe around us. They don't in their world. They live, they think they live on the inside of a sphere. So Maxim is telling another one of the characters um, to be aware that you don't live inside a sphere. You live on the outside of a sphere. And he says, um... By the way, Bohr, don't forget to tell your friends that you don't live on the inner surface of a sphere. You live on the outer surface of a sphere. And there are many such spheres in existence on which people live far worse than you do, and some on which they live far better. But nowhere do they live more stupidly. <laughs> so I thought that was really kind of interesting, because if you, if you have this idea that you are it, right? Your world is all there is, then it's a very constraining kind of a worldview to have. Whereas if you have an outward sort of view where you realize, oh, there could be lots of other civilizations, lots of other ways of doing things than what we're doing here, you know, it sort of gives you a different, a different perspective, I think. So I thought that was kind of cool. All right, I think I will stop the chat with that. I'm not sure I did this book justice, but my next chat is going to be probably going to be The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwell, and I am not quite finished with this yet. This was the first locked room mystery ever written from 1892, The Big Bow Mystery. So stay tuned for that. Should have this coming up fairly soon. Until next time, take care. Bye.